people think that goes away in April with the heat. Welcome back to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chaz the Chidale. The conventions are over. Election day is barely two months away. Is Joe Biden actually blowing this? We're going to be talking to Biden's longtime advisor, Celinda Lake, and I boldly predict she will disagree. And I'll explain how the Electoral College works and how it helps Trump. And I'm going to be looking at the president's outreach to black voters. Does his record match his rhetoric? First to Wisconsin, President Trump travelled to the swing state earlier today, a week after a 17-year-old youth shot and killed two people in the town of Kenosha. Black Lives Matter demonstrations triggered by the police shooting of Jacob Blake two days earlier were accompanied by counter-protests and riots as stores were looted and businesses burned. Teenager Kyle Rittenhouse armed himself to defend local businesses and allegedly received encouragement from local police. Later, he shot two protesters, Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber. It was all filmed. Rittenhouse has been charged with offences including two counts of first-degree murder. The teen's attorneys say Kyle had no choice but to fire multiple rounds towards his immediate attackers. But on Friday, the Kenosha police chief said the shootings never should have happened. We've had two people lose their lives senselessly while peacefully protesting. Kyle Rittenhouse had previously attended a Trump rally. The president telling reporters yesterday it looked like self-defense to him. He was trying to get away from them, I guess, it looks like. And he fell. And then they very violently attacked him. And it was something that we're looking at right now, and it's under investigation. But... Uh, I guess he was in very big trouble. He would have been, I, he probably would have been killed, but it's under, it's under investigation. Yeah, and Rittenhouse's lawyer is making similar arguments, John. He's saying that Rittenhouse didn't appoint himself deputy sheriff. He was just answering a call for help from a local business owner. And his lawyer also said in Rittenhouse's first shooting that there was another gunshot that caused Rittenhouse to turn around and see the fellow he was about to shoot reaching for his rifle. And the video does kind of back that up. Warning, I'm about to show you the New York Times' very blurry, distant version of the first shooting. And note the separate first gunshot. Will that make any difference to Rittenhouse's defence? I don't know. I guess we'll see. Law and order has emerged as a major theme in President Trump's re-election campaign. And after arriving in Kenosha today over the objections of state and local officials, President Trump refused to condemn the right-wing militias taking to the streets. I think a lot of people are looking at what's happening to these Democrat-run cities and they're disgusted. They see what's going on. And they can't believe this is taking place in our country. I can't believe it either. Trump's presidential rival Joe Biden was in another key battleground state, Pennsylvania, yesterday. Speaking in Pittsburgh, Biden condemned the rioters and accused Trump of encouraging the violence. Fires are burning and we have a president who fans the flames rather than fighting the flames. But we must not burn. We have to build. This president long ago forfeited any moral leadership in this country. He can't stop the violence because for years he's fomented it. Another man was shot and killed in Portland, Oregon on the weekend. 39-year-old Aaron J. Danielson was reportedly wearing the insignia of a far-right organisation, Patriot Prayer, at the time of his death. The shooting came after a series of escalating street clashes. Some in the pro-Trump caravan veered off the planned route, going into the city's downtown core, <laughs> where startling confrontations with counter-protesters unfolded. A Trump flag is burned as insults and items are hurled at the vehicles. Trump supporters shot paintballs from an open truck bed and fired pepper spray. The evening turned deadly when a man standing in front of this parking garage was shot. Not much is known publicly about what led to this moment, but the victim has been linked to a pro-Trump group. But as for who's behind all of these groups, Chaz, speaking to Fox News yesterday, President Trump said Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organisation starting a revolution controlling Joe Biden and he was a bit mysterious as to who he thinks behind them. Look at what's going on. And Biden, well, Biden is, I, I don't even like to mention Biden because he's not controlling anything. Who, who do you they think is pulling him. Biden's strings? Uh, is it former Obama People officials? that you've never heard of. 
people that are in the dark shadows, people that oh, What are, does that mean? That sounds like conspiracy theory, dark shadows. No, what is people that people that you haven't heard of. They're, they're people that are on the streets. They're people that are controlling the streets. We had somebody get on a plane from a certain city this weekend. And in the plane, it was almost completely loaded with, with thugs wearing these dark uniforms, black uniforms with gear and this and that. They're, they're on a plane. Where is the where is per, I, I'll tell you sometime, but I, I, it's under investigation right now. What? A bit of a gift to Sarah Cooper there, Chaz. That was pretty weird. I suspect Trump might be confusing a viral email from June there with something that's actually happening. Mm. Anyway, this is an interesting tactic Trump is taking here, though. Remember, exactly four years ago, he was saying this. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation will soon, and I mean very soon, come to an end. And then, at his inauguration, he said this. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. And yet, four years later, when there's more violence out there, he's still saying that he can stop it. Well, then stop it, Mr. President, like you say you can. Of course, he can't stop it. This is a local issue, not really something a president has control over. He was being opportunistic in 2016, and he's still being opportunistic now. And he's not the only one. Republican activist Charlie Kirk somehow concluded that Democrats in Wisconsin are now directly responsible for the two deaths from the Rittenhouse shootings. And the only solution to this massive terrorism is to vote Trump. Huh? Mind you, the Democrats have been pretty opportunistic as well, blaming Trump for riots caused by police shootings. All of this chaos is happening on his watch. This is very much characteristic of living in Donald Trump's America, and I think we're going to see more and more of it as long as he's in charge. So were the Michael Brown riots Obama's fault then? Regardless, I think what Trump might be thinking of with this tactic is this Marquette poll, which found net approval of Black Lives Matter in Wisconsin dropping from plus 25% in June to dead even three weeks ago. And amongst white Wisconsinites, it dropped from plus 21% to minus 6%. Even though amongst non-white Wisconsinites, it stayed steady at plus 58%. I think Trump might like the look of those white Wisconsin numbers. Except, according to Gallup's August numbers, 35% of people say coronavirus is the most important issue of the election, compared to only 4% who say crime and violence is. So the issue isn't resonating as much as Trump would like. And most importantly, at least so far, people are preferring Biden to solve the problem. 37% said they'd feel safer if Biden was elected a month ago. And now, after the conventions, it's 39%. The needle hasn't moved. And neither has the needle moved for Trump, except his numbers are worse. A month ago, only 31% said Trump being re-elected would make them feel safer, and now it's 32%. So this is a bit of a reach for Trump, John. Yeah, it sure is. Last week's Republican National Convention ended with a bang. Donald Trump's name spelled out over the Washington Monument at the conclusion of his renomination speech given on the South Lawn of the White House, where he spelled out his line of attack. Biden is a Trojan horse for socialism. If Joe Biden doesn't have the strength to stand up to wild-eyed Marxists like Bernie Sanders and his fellow radicals, and there are many, there are many, many, we see them all the time, it's incredible, actually, then how is he ever going to stand up for you? He's not. And this was Joe Biden's answer to that socialist Trojan horse claim in Pittsburgh yesterday. You know me. You know my heart. You know my story, my family story. Ask yourself, do I look like a radical socialist with a soft spot for rioters? Really? There may have been a modest convention bounce in the polls for President Trump. Last Monday, as the convention was getting underway, Trump trailed Biden by 7.8 points in the average of national polls. A week later, that had closed to 6.2 points. And there has been a similar closing of the gap in the top battleground states. Biden's lead of 4.3% at the start of the convention fortnight, down this week to just 2.7%. 
One more interesting element at the convention though, John. Trump mentioned Joe Biden 41 times in his speech, whereas the previous most mentions of an opponent's name in the president's acceptance speech was eight by Bush one in 1992. And the next most mentions was two. And Trump might have gotten the results he was looking for with all those attacks. According to SurveyMonkey, amongst independents who don't lean towards either party, Biden dropped from a net approval of minus five to minus 18 in one week. Mind you, Trump also slid a little from a net approval of minus 35 to minus 37. And one more interesting post-convention poll. Hill Harris X reckons Trump's total approval amongst black voters increased from 15% up to 24%. Still not very high, but his convention's appeals to black voters may not have fallen on deaf ears. All right. With President Trump closing the gap with Joe Biden in a number of these polls, a certain amount of hand-wringing has returned to some Democratic circles this week. Despite historically low approval ratings, could it be that Donald Trump is getting set to spring another shock election victory? Celinda Lake is one of the most revered pollsters and strategists in Democratic politics. She's worked with Vice President Joe Biden for many years. She's with us from Washington, D.C. Celinda Lake, welcome back to Planet America. Thanks for having me. It's great to join you. We're looking at these national and battleground state polls and seeing a certain tightening of the race in the last month or so. Is that your perception also, or are you looking at other indicators to get a sense as to where this race is up to? Well, I think we thought the race was always a tight race. And so... It's really, we're in a very polarized country. It depends a lot on what the turnout model is. We're down to about nine battleground states. So it's really where we thought it would be all the way along. Uh, a tight race where uh, Joe Biden still has a lead and where Donald Trump has a net negative job performance. So uh, that's not a place that you want to be in if you're trying to get reelected. So, Celinda, are you telling me you're not getting a teensy little bit nervous about the tightening of the polls? Well, I'm not getting a teensy bit nervous because I was plenty nervous for a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm in my zen mode. I'm in the steady state of being nervous. <laughs> Selinda, there has been a, a certain consistency in the polls, certainly the national head-to-head -head polls over more than 18 months now. Joe Biden, three to nine points in front of Donald Trump. Trump never getting above around 45%. Biden never getting below kind of 47%. Is that a, is that a good indication as to there is a fundamental dynamic here that almost exists separate to the daily issues or the news cycle? Yes, and, and uh, the vote for Donald Trump highly, highly correlated with his job performance. So actually, more than his vote, I watch his job performance, and that's really been stuck. It dropped down a little bit, but it's been stuck basically 45, 46, and that's what drives that number. You also have the underlying partisanship, and this country is about three, four points Democratic. And so, you know, it depends a lot on turnout. A lot of this is going to come out, too whose votes get cast and whose votes get counted. Celinda, so Trafalgar polling is still out there doing their thing, insisting that there's a shy Trumper vote out there that's going to power Trump to victory. Why do you think there isn't a shy Trumper vote out there waiting to be mobilised? Well, I actually think there is a shy Trump vote, yeah. and we measure it, and you still have uh, Joe Biden ahead with a shy tr uh, Trump vote. The Trafalgar pollsters are weighting their data very, very heavily, and they're not just, we do a measurement of whether or not there is a shy Trump vote by state, but they are weighting their data for quote unquote social desirability. That is a completely unproven methodology, uh, a very arbitrary rating. And so I, not all pollsters on the Democratic side agree. I happen to be one of the ones who believes there is often a secret Trump vote, and we um, calculate that. So, Linda, as well as trying to deepen his existing base, President Trump has, in the last week or two, been trying to reach out to African Americans and suburban college-educated women in particular, it seems, from some of his messaging at the RNC. How successful do you think that will be? So, what he's trying to do is discourage African American voters from turning out to vote. And I think that's not going to be very successful, but you're absolutely right that he's trying to do that. He's also trying to reach out to Latinx voters, and I don't think that's going to be very successful. And he's trying to reach out to suburban women voters, and I think that's actually backfiring. Suburban women, uh, particularly as 
as their kids are going back to school, really, really upset that their families are in this situation, that COVID wasn't handled better, and that they have no good choices in terms of the chaos that's facing their families. And we're actually picking up folks among suburban women. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a gender gap, which is the difference between male and female voting on steroids in this election, as suburban uh, voters totally reject uh, the president's approach, his lack of a plan, his lack of listening to experts, and his policies that put their families at risk. So from a tactical point of view, in terms of reaching suburban voters, etc., do you think he's making the right play with a law and order campaign, or do you think that's actually a, a poor tactical choice? I think it's a desperate tactical choice. And I think it's about all he's got left. But I think this combination of dog whistle politics and using violence as a tactic, as a strategy, is abhorrent, immoral, and I think it will backfire. Celinda Lake, always appreciate your insights. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Donald Trump won the presidency of the United States with almost three million fewer votes than his rival Hillary Clinton. You may be wondering, how is that possible? Was it Russia, the FBI, a lizard posing as Julian Assange? In fact, the answer is the Electoral College. America has some pretty weird colleges. At Trump University, we teach success. That's what it's all about, success. Like the now-defunct Trump University, the Electoral College is not a real university or college. And like Trump University, it does not award grades, credits or degrees. Although twice in the past 20 years, it has awarded the presidency to the loser of the popular vote. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. In 2016, the founder of Trump University won the presidency with just under 63 million votes, while Hillary Clinton lost the presidency with nearly 66 million, a losing margin of plus 2.8 million. In the Electoral College, however, Trump won 304 votes to Clinton's 227. Hillary Clinton has called Donald Trump to concede the race. It's not the first time that's happened either. 20 years ago, Al Gore won half a million votes more than George W. Bush, but lost in the Electoral College and lost the presidency. I accept the finality of this outcome, which will be ratified next Monday in the Electoral College. Twice in the 19th century, the winner of the popular vote lost the Electoral College. In 1876, Democrat Sam Tilden led by a quarter of a million votes, but Republican Rutherford Hayes won the Electoral College. In 1888, Democratic President Grover Cleveland attracted over 90,000 more votes than Republican Benjamin Harrison, but Harrison won the Electoral College. So, what is this Electoral College thing anyway? The founders of the United States had just turfed out an English king and they didn't want to create another monarchy. They thought long and hard about how to limit the power of their new head of state. First, the title. Forget king or emperor, it would be president. So named because they were to preside over the constitution and approve or veto the will of Congress, but done with balanced powers. Having that president directly elected by the people posed a problem. Would that give them too much power? A popular mandate exceeding that of the House and the Senate. Then again, they couldn't be beholding to Congress either, so instead they settled on an indirect election by an electoral college. Think of the electoral college as being like a council or a parliament that sits once every four years with only one job, electing the president and vice president of the United States. And here's how it works. Each state gets as many electors in the Electoral College as it has members of Congress, House and Senate, plus three from Washington DC, currently adding up to 538, meaning you need 270 for a majority. Sounds fairly democratic, the House seats are distributed roughly proportionate to population, but the Senate is different. Every state gets two senators, whether it's Wyoming with a population of under 600,000 or California with 39 million more people. That's your first clue about how the Electoral College doesn't always reflect the popular vote. 48 states are winner-takes-all. Maine and Nebraska split theirs up. But if we look at three of the biggest states, California, Texas and Pennsylvania, 
You'll see how Republicans have an advantage, at least for now. California, that's the big one. 55 electoral votes going to Hillary Clinton. That was expected. She wins at the biggest Democratic prize of the night. In 2016, Democrat Hillary Clinton won California's 55 electoral votes by a mile, over 4 million votes, almost doubling Trump's vote. We project that uh, Donald Trump will carry a huge prize. Texas, with all of its 38 electoral votes, a big win for Donald Trump in the state of Texas. Democrats had hope, but not, uh, it's not going to happen for them this time around. In Texas, it was closer. Trump won with a margin of over 800,000, claiming all 38 electoral votes. Some big news here, Megan. Huge news, uh, actually. The AP now projecting that Donald Trump has won the state of Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania was closer still. Trump's margin of 44,000 gave him another 20 electoral votes. Add that all up, and Hillary Clinton got more than 15.5 million votes and 55 electoral votes. Trump got just over 12 million votes and 58 in the Electoral College. And count the votes of the electors... Of the like the two senator rule, the Electoral College is designed to protect the interests of smaller states. And if we go back to Wyoming and California, while Wyoming only gets three electoral votes, that's equal to one for every 192,000 people, while California's 55 electoral votes represent 718,000 citizens. Above all, it's about how to become successful. So the Electoral College can look a bit dodgy, although unlike Trump University, it hasn't had to pay people back for ripping them off just yet. That's what it's all about. Oh, and don't be surprised if this year's election also ends up in the courts. Now, we mentioned earlier that Trump was hoping to win more of the black vote. He put it this way in his convention speech. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. Very modestly, he says. Hmm. OK, that's a bit much. But does Trump have a genuine case to make that he's been good for the black community? To the wall! Big, beautiful world. The Republican convention touted a number of ways this administration has helped black people. So let's start with... The first new major effort to tackle poverty in a generation, Opportunity Zones. Opportunity Zones involve investors being given a capital gains tax cut for returns on investments in areas the government defines as economically distressed. The longer you invest, the bigger your tax cut. Now, 94% of capital gains go to people with incomes over $100,000. So that tax cut is going to rich people. But if the rich people are investing in poor areas, that's a win-win, right? Maybe. There's certainly investment happening. $10 billion before the COVID-19 crisis. But the vast majority of that, that investment appears to be in real estate. Some of it luxury real estate, not local businesses. And the reason for that is if your entire incentive structure is capital gains tax cuts, investors are going to focus on capital gains. And most useful projects have a return of only 3 to 7%, not the 12 to 16% the market is looking for. Furthermore, there are some affluent areas within some of these poor census tracts. In fact, nearly 200 of the 8,800 opportunity zones are not even considered low income. So, there's some loopholes there. And most investors freely admit their projects would have proceeded even without the Opportunity Zones. Look, I'm, I'm not trying to knock the program. It has done some good, but at this stage, it's a bit... Eh, could definitely do some tweaking. Next. In historically black colleges and universities, I saved HBCUs. We saved them. No, no, you didn't. They were going out and we saved them. <sighs> Why don't we run that phrase through the Trump translation machine? We get, yeah. So, is that claim true? Well, in Trump's first two fiscal years, HBCUs received about $1.6 billion, which, when you adjust that number for inflation, is almost exactly what they received under Obama's first two fiscal years. But then, at the end of 2019, Congress passed and Trump signed the Future Act, which guaranteed $85 million a year allocated to fund science, tech and maths programs at HBCUs. And on top of that, Betsy DeVos granted total forgiveness of Hurricane Katrina relief loans to four HBCUs that were worth more than $300 million. One of those university presidents was keen to point out that Obama could have done that, and he didn't. 
Finally, the CARES Act this year added another $450 million of funding for HBCU. So, the Trump administration has done reasonably well in this area. Or, to put that in Trumpese... He single-handedly turned HBCUs from pathetic garbage to the super-duper strongest organisations in the history of the universe. Wow! Next! He signed the First Step Act into law. It was real justice reform. In just the first year of the First Step Act, over 2,000 federal prisoners had their sentences reduced by about six years on average, and 91% of those prisoners were black. There were also 107 extra compassionate releases. And it increased good behaviour credits by seven days per year, which led to 3,100 further federal prisoners being freed almost immediately. Although, about 800 of those 3,000 prisoners were freed to be deported by ICE. And 55% of the remaining prisoners were white. Nevertheless, the First Step Act improved the lives of thousands of prisoners. It'd be doing even better if the prisons received the extra $300 million they need to implement all its required programs, as opposed to the $23 million they just received instead. But something's better than nothing, OK? Finally, there is this claim. The president also built the most inclusive economy ever with record low unemployment for African Americans. OK, now I'm going to ignore COVID because it's basically screwed up Trump's whole record. There are now fewer black employed Americans than there were when he took over. So everything I'm about to say only goes up to February this year, OK? Right, Trump in his first three years and one month oversaw 1.3 million jobs being created for black people. That is a 7.1% increase. Great! But in Obama's second term, in the equivalent period, he oversaw 1.75 million jobs being created for black people, which is a 10.9% increase. Now, I say second term because the beginning of Obama's first term was all recession. I'm being fair to Obama like I am being to Trump. But if you think I'm cherry-picking, why don't we look at Obama's final three years and one month directly before Trump? That is... 2.1 million new jobs for black people, or a 13% increase, much better than Trump did straight after. In terms of reducing unemployment, Trump saw 278,000 black people come off the unemployment rolls, a reduction of 1.7 points on the black unemployment rate, compared to a much better result under Obama, between a four and five point reduction in the black unemployment rate in his second term. And while we're at it, let's compare to Bill Clinton as well. Either of his terms, both terms under Clinton, had the same number of jobs being created for black people as Trump had, but with a much smaller population. So that was actually a 10% increase, better than Trump. And he also saw more black people coming off the unemployment rolls as well, even though he had a smaller population. In other words, even if we ignore the fact that presidents don't create jobs and we ignore what COVID's done to Trump's record, he still has not done as much for black employment than either of his two preceding Democratic presidents. But this is still not a bad record until COVID. Equally, it's true that Opportunity Zones are at best a work in progress. Funding for HBCUs and criminal justice reform were both spearheaded by Congress rather than the administration. But if you run all this back through the translating machine, it's not bad. It's not exactly LBJ's civil rights reforms, but it's OK. Is it enough to vote for? We'll see. Big, beautiful world. Finally this week, an update on the coronavirus pandemic and some good news. It looks like the virus is not as deadly as the mainstream media first made it out to be. And that comes from an impeccable source, the Twitter account of businessman Herman Cain, who, I kid you not, died after being hospitalised with coronavirus in June, nine days after he attended a Trump rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Chaz, it's not just Herman Cain's Cain gang that is putting this idea about this week. President Trump has been retweeting the same claim that only 6% of deaths attributed to COVID are actually 
COVID deaths. And he's not just taking dead Herman Cain's word for it either. It's a Twitter account called Little Mel, who also promotes QAnon conspiracy theories and takes a particular interest in not just Trump, but Ukraine and German politics. Exactly like a Russian bot might do. Trump's retweet of Little Mel has been taken down for a breach of rules by Twitter. Yeah, look, it's related to this article here, John. Shock report! This week, CDC quietly updated their COVID-19 numbers. And here's a screen cap from the CDC. It's based on, for 6% of deaths, COVID-19 was the only cause mentioned on the death certificate. So, that's the big conspiracy. 94% of deaths have comorbidities like diabetes or asthma, which we already knew. And by the way, it's not some new quiet revelation from the CDC. This was their webpage on May the 30th. It was there then. But I think this story does sum up this era well, John, because that website, Gateway Pundit, it's run by a guy called Jim Hoft. And if you Google the phrase, dumbest man on the <laughs> internet, you'll find seven of the top ten results are about him. And he's now a genuine information source for the President of the United States. A toast. Out of context at the conventions. It's senior wars as Joe Biden fails the mass test Trump set for him. Too much anger, too much fear, too much division. While Trump has his own senior moments. What's the name of that building? And tries to cover for it unconvincingly. Many things have a different name now. Meanwhile, Kamala lets slip that she doesn't know how to spell the word virus. This virus? It has no eyes. And reveals her fervent hope to one day join the circus. And there's another woman whose name isn't known, whose story isn't shared, another woman whose shoulders I stand on. While Trump unveils his plan to keep Kamala away from the White House. America will land the first woman on the moon. That was out of context at the conventions. And that's it for another trip to Planet America. We'll see you back here at the same time next week. And you can join us for a fireside chat on ABC News on Friday night. Our guest will be the BBC's man in America, Nick Bryant. Good night. <laughs>